Good morning, church. Welcome. As you're finding your seat, make sure you have a worship bulletin with you. Go ahead and open up to the front there. We're going to start with our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 100. So would you stand for the reading of God's word? And then read the bolded text aloud with me. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Oh, for a thousand tongues. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name so come on and sing out let our anthem grow loud there is one great love jesus Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foulest clean, His blood availed for me. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love, Jesus. Speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love, Jesus.
At Fountain City, we affirm the authority of Scripture as the infallible Word of God, the foundation of our faith. And so we believe it is important to commit Scripture to heart. So during Philippians, we're practicing Scripture memorization as a church. So would you read this section aloud with me? Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> Philippians 4, we've been in this for a, a couple weeks now. Let's read it together. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving and prayer, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. sure and steady my hope is held in your hand when castles crumble and breath is fleeting upon this rock I will stand upon this rock I will stand Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all. Shattered and broken, the curse of sin's tyranny. My life is hidden neath heaven's shadow. Your crimson flood covers me. Your crimson flood covers me. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all. sorrows Jesus is better make my heart believe in every victory Jesus is better make my heart believe than any comfort Jesus is better, make my heart believe. More 
than all riches. Jesus is better. Make my heart believe that our souls declaring Jesus is better. Make my heart believe our song Jesus, Lord of all. approach the throne of grace, knowing that he has paid the price of sin for us. So hear this word from Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Would you take a moment in personal prayer? of your love 
will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I'm made whole. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. Oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares your embrace light of the world forever reign hear the word of the Lord from Romans 5 therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Welcome to Fountain City Church. Uh, Whether you're joining us in person, as several people are, or online, we're glad that you're here. My name is Doug, and um, just we have a, we'll introduce us and and, uh, give a few announcements before we bring James up to preach. And so, um, Fountain City is a a newer church, or a church plant, planted about two years ago here in Overland Park and Prairie Village, and uh, we are a church that believes that we were created to have a relationship with God, and that relationship with God is found through Jesus. And so we exist to, to, to grow in that relationship and then to tell others about it. And I was looking at this wall earlier today, just thinking of the, you know, the different stones. It's a beautiful wall, and you can, I think you can see it online. And I think of it, I, I look at that every week, and as a kid, I, th- I would have thought I would have liked to climb that wall. But, uh, but now I think of that you know, each stone represents... You know, a piece of that wall that now is very strong, and, I, and, it, and it kind of represents our church too. The things we learn on Sunday mornings and throughout our throughout our week, 
from the Bible kind of represents a stone, a truth that builds a foundation that eventually builds a wall. And that's why we want to, uh, we want to, ex- or we exist as a church so that we can be strong, so that we can stand up against the storms of life, so that we can uh, pr- provide shelter and we can, and we can be protected uh, when things of life hit us. And so, um, anyway, we're glad that you're here. That was a little bit of a spur of the moment, so it, I'm not sure if that fell on you well or not, but uh, it, felt, it sounded really good in my mind when I was, when I was thinking of it. Anyway, we do have a couple of announcements, and uh, for those of you who braved, uh, who, who missed part of the Chiefs game a couple weeks ago for membership class, kudos to you, uh, eternal glory to, to you guys. Uh, you know, the fact that the Chiefs lost the, you know, last week kind of diminishes the splendor of that, of that game that, that you were in the membership class. But anyway, part two is this, is tonight. And so um, if, you're, if you're wanting to be a part of the, a member of Fountain City Church and, uh, and interested or whether you're wanting to be a member or not or just learn about it, I uh, encourage you to come to part two of that membership class tonight. It's at 8 o'clock. It's on Zoom. And so those of you who've been to that class already probably have a link. Uh, if you've been connected with Fountain City at all, there's a Zoom link that was sent out through an email, and it's on Slack if you're on Slack. If you don't have that and you're wanting to come, please talk to James, and James will get that to you uh, before tonight. Uh, it's about an hour long, and it'll be, a, it'll be great just to learn about what's the process and, and what you get a little, give a little bit of history and, and, uh, about Fountain City and what we're about. So that's tonight. And then the other thing I wanted to mention um, is this. If, if on Wednesday night of this week, we usually have home groups, but this week we're doing something special. We're having a congregational meeting. So it doesn't disrupt, and so we're um, from the normal schedule. So if you're used to coming to home groups, just come here on Wednesday night at 5:30. We're going to have pizza, I think, or some type of supper. And so if you have it, I know Lindsay has um, sent out a uh, an email asking for people to RSVP if they're going to come, so that we can plan for food. And so if, if you haven't done that, please do do so. Uh, but that's going to be a chance to for us to look forward, kind of look back and celebrate what God's been doing in our midst uh, the past uh, few months. And then to look forward to the next six months and, and what we're going to be looking forward to in the next sermon series after we finish Philippians. And so it'll be a great time of fellowship and sharing, uh, just hanging out together and, and getting uh, an idea of what God, where God is taking us and where God is leading us. So please come on Wednesday night. It'll be, a, it'll be a great time and it'll be in person. So we'd love for you to be there. With that, um, let's, uh, we're going to read God's word from today with, from uh, the book of Philippians, where James will be preaching from. And so if you're able, would you please stand with me while I read this? And I'm going to put my glasses on. So Philippians 4, verses 4, or 14 through 20, Paul writes this. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. And I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Doug. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Welcome. We are two weeks away. Today, this week, and next week uh, will be our last couple weeks in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Man, I've really enjoyed this. I hope you've been blessed by God's word as we've walked through this letter together. Um, But two more weeks, then we'll move into something different. And yeah, it's kind of weird not having a game to mess with our life as a church this week. It's been like the NFL has not helped us much as a church This season, everything's been scheduled weird. So anyway, the books are clean. It kind of stinks, but we'll take it. Um, So kids, 
I, gotta, I wanna tell you a little bit, a little story from my life. When I was just out of college, so I was about 22, and one time some, some, uh, a couple of friends and I went camping. We were uh, on this trail that was a very popular trail for, for uh, like campers and hikers to go down, and we spent the night on uh, the far end of the trail, and on the second day, when we were coming back, it rained, and it rained all day, and it kept raining, and we had to get home. We were in a hurry, so we went through the rain, but when we got to the, almost the beginning of the trail where our car was, we were like a mile away from our car, we came to a river, and the river, because of all the rain, was so full, we couldn't get across. It was, it was taller than me. The water was like that tall, and it was so fast. And if we tried to go through it, it we, we probably would have died. So we couldn't go. And what was really kind of scary for us was we had eaten all of our food. We had drank all of our water. We didn't know where we would sleep that night. We didn't think very well about our planning on this trip. Uh, but on the other side of the river, there were a couple other guys who were about our age, and they saw that we were stuck, and they saw that we were telling them we were in trouble. And you know what they did? They said, oh my goodness, how can we help you? We said, I, I don't know, we're, we're hungry. And one of the guys took out a Subway sandwich that was in his bag that he was looking forward to eating at lunchtime, a whole sandwich. And you know what he did? He took the sandwich and he whipped it and he threw it across the river and we, got, and we caught it and we had some food and we got to eat that guy's lunch because he was so kind to us because we had nothing. And man, were we grateful for that sandwich. It was the best meatball sandwich I've ever had. Um, and it reminded me this week of something we're gonna talk about today, and that is the word generosity. Generosity. Has anybody ever given you something special like that, like something you weren't expecting, something you didn't really deserve, but they said, here, I wanna give you something. Has anybody ever done that for you? Maybe at school, somebody's given you some of their, their, like their snack or their dessert, maybe a present. Anybody wanna share something that somebody's given them? Can you think of anything? It's kind of a hard one to think of quickly. How about this? Have you ever given to someone something that you thought was generous? Have you ever said, I want to give you something that was generous? I bet you have. I see some hands coming up. Anybody, anybody willing to share? It's okay to share this one if you, if you want to. And you want to try? Go ahead. Legos. Yes, when you share Legos, that can be dangerous because you may never see the Legos again, right? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes we share like our markers or our crayons or maybe like something special that mom made, like a dessert or dad made. We share that with our friend. And we know that when we give it, we, we, we're not going to get it back. And that person might keep it. And, and we, it's hard to give that sometimes and to be generous, isn't it? Sometimes when we, when we have something and give it, it can be hard to give it. We're going to look at this today. God says that we can always be generous and be generous like without worrying at any time that we can always give of what we have. Do you know why? Because God will always give us what we need to be generous. Jesus will always give us what we need in order to be generous with other people. We can always be generous. We're going to talk about that today. So as we go, here's your, here's your uh, little assignment, okay? I'm going to have you count the word generous. You hear that one? Generous or generosity. If you hear those words, count them in your little worship book. I know there might be a page where you can make a note. We say, oh, there it is. Just make your little marker. It won't be as much as it was like a few weeks ago when I think our word was stand firm and you guys were just going like this. It will be a little bit slower today. But that's the word, generous, okay? All right, let's take a minute and, uh, and pray before we get further into our sermon this morning. So please pray with me. Father, we give you thanks for this morning. Where we recognize and acknowledge that you are the Lord, you are the maker of heaven and earth. The sun rises this morning because you set it in its place. You hold all things together. You've given us our lives and you have brought us here. And we give you thanks for this blessing and this opportunity. We thank you for your promise that you are here among us. That as we gather in the name of Jesus, God, you, the creator of the universe, gather here with us as well by your spirit. We ask that as we open your word, that you would teach us that you would help us to understand what you have revealed. We trust that all of your word, all scripture is God-breathed and of you and useful for us. And so we ask this morning that you would teach us through these verses. I said you would help me in my words to honor you and be clear. I pray that in all of this, God, 
you would work in us that we might be renewed by the, uh, or be transformed by the renewing of our minds, and that in that you would be glorified and that we would be transformed more into the image of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, several years ago, Lindsay and I were going through a really tough moment, a, a tough year, and we had a couple of a couple in our life who we knew. We didn't know them super well, but we knew them. And I think because of the, the grief we were experiencing and some other things, they wanted to do something kind for us. It was like some comfort or consolation. And they gave us two financial gifts that were cra- crazy big. Uh, we were like, we couldn't believe it. We just blew our minds how generous these people were with us. Have you ever had someone give you something that just was beyond your expectation of generosity? Has, has anyone, anyone ever just given you, whether it's something financial, you weren't expecting it, they did a favor for you, they just went so far beyond what you could have expected, they connected you with somebody, they covered for you at work. I mean, I, I know people who've been given cars. People do some generous, generous things for us. Has anybody ever done that for you, something is super generous? Many years later, it is still hard for me to, like, believe that this couple did for me and Lynn's what they did because of how I am so often not generous, how hard it can be for me to be generous. This morning, we're going to look at generosity. We're going to talk all about that. I think Paul's One of the things we can glean from these verses this morning is about generosity. There's a lot that's kind of hidden in uh, in the details here. We're going to, I'm going to focus on that, that point of of generosity. Generosity is a, is such a good thing. And we know that intuitively. We know that from experience, but it can also be such a hard thing to give, to be generous. Even when, I mean, I, I looked this up, scientific studies show that a generous life is a healthier life, a more fulfilling life, a happier life. And yet even still, it can be hard for us to live generously. So this morning we're going to talk about this. We're going to look at uh, a few things. We're going to talk about how generosity is good and just acknowledge that. We're going to look at how, where generosity comes from and that it comes from a kind of freedom and that that freedom comes from having been given everything in Jesus. And so the big point this morning, here's the points you're going to be preached. The gospel frees us to live a generous life because Christ has given us everything. The gospel frees us to live a generous life because Christ has given us everything. So first thing this morning we're going to talk about is this. The point one is is that generosity is good. Generosity is good. Now, when Doug read the passage, you might not have heard this coming straight out from it, and that's because... This passage is a little awkward. Um, I don't know if you picked up on that, but Paul's language is a little bit awkward. It's not as straightforward or just kind of clear cut. And, and uh, it's like he's, you know, he's giving thanks for something, which we're going to talk about, and he is. But he's saying like, thanks. It can feel like he's saying thanks, but no thanks. Or thanks, but I didn't really need it. You know? and, and it can come across as like, what kind of thank you is that? Um, and so let's get into the situation here. Remember, The Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to a church in Philippi, he wrote this book of Philippians to a church that he had planted in this ancient city of Philippi. From the very first time that he went there, that Paul went to this city and planted the church, these Christians in Philippi, they had been financially supporting Paul. They'd been giving him financial gifts throughout his ministry to help him on his way, to help him everywhere he went. And he says they were the only ones who did this. And I think the reason why, just as a little side detail... The reason why that's true is because Philippi was the first city that Paul came to in Europe, and they were like wanting to give to him, and it seems like he he accepted that. But then as he went along, we know that he said, okay, I don't know that that's the best idea, and he started to just kind of uh, operate without taking or receiving gifts from the churches he planted. But Philippi was different. For some reason, he allowed that to happen, and they they consistently supported him in his ministry. Well, in this letter, remember a, a few months ago, we saw how a man named Epaphroditus who was a Christian in Philippi, went from Philippi to Rome where Paul was in prison and he brought this huge financial gift to Paul because Paul needed that because in a Roman prison, a prisoner was responsible for providing all of their needs, food, drink, clothing, anything you needed. You had to pay for it yourself. And so they brought him this gift and he needed it in prison. And now he's responding to that. And he is saying, thank you. But in, a Roman, in, in the Roman society, you need to understand that there was like this unwritten code for 
how you handled that, for how you handled giving and receiving, for how you handled charity and generosity. And, and that's really what Paul is acknowledging, is that these Christian, uh, Christians in Philippi were generous to him. They gave to him far and above what was expected, far and above what was deserved, without any expectation that Paul would repay him or repay them. And that is basically generosity. Giving far and above what, you're deser- what someone deserves with no expectation of being repaid. And he, said, and he wants them to know how thankful he is. But because of this unwritten code, he's kind of dancing around it a little bit. And that's because the, uh, when someone gave charitably in the Roman society, in the Greek society, there were like these expectations or these roles that could develop in a relationship that made it awkward or inappropriate, and you didn't want that to happen. And that might not make sense to us today, but we have some social normalities or formalities like that as well. And in Paul's day, this was going on. And so what he wants them to hear clearly, and we need to hear this, is he is grateful and he's thankful. And he's saying, what you did was a good thing. Your generosity was good. Thank you. And you see this in verse 14 where he says, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. It was good of you to give to me financially when I was in need. Thank you. He's just acknowledging that. And it's just important for us to to remind ourselves, generosity is such a good thing. Giving to someone, anyone, above and beyond what they deserve with no expectation of being repaid, it's a good thing. How many times have have you, as as we mentioned at the beginning, been blessed by this? I mean, I think of when people will listen to me. They give of their time. You know, hey, man, I'm having a a tough week. Could you just sit down and listen to me and and take some of your time, which is probably your most valuable resource, and share that with me? Or when we're financially in need. You know, Johnson County, Kansas, that might not feel as normal, but there are many places in our city where people are in financial need, and just sharing with them and being generous with them is awesome. When someone gives you a job that you didn't ask for, or a promotion at work that maybe someone else could have gotten, but they they like you and they want to give it to you. It might be nepotistic, I don't know. But in the workplace, maybe that's okay. Generosity is such a good thing. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, of course it is. I know that. Why do we need to be told that? Well, because of what I already mentioned, it can be really hard to be generous. It can be really hard to be generous. We need to acknowledge that. And I'm sharing from personal just reflection and being beat up this week by looking at this passage and looking at this subject. How often, I mean, what's your response when you walk by like a Salvation Army bucket year after year after year? And we, well, I don't have often you walk past them, but you walk past them. Sometimes I'm like, I'm like, gosh, are you serious? Do I have to get my change out? Do I have to give a look for money? And I don't want to hear me say that, but I think we all kind of do that at some point. Don't we? Or you get to the year in ministry asks. If you ever support a ministry and they, they have your address, they'll send you like, a, hey, we have this, these needs at the end of the year. Can you help us with, with that? And then Lindsay and I get probably, we get a lot of those. And, we get, and you go, oh, do we need to? Do we have to? Or how about when someone asks you for time? Like I mentioned, someone says, hey, can we get together? Could we get a cup of coffee? And you have an already busy schedule. You don't want to have to give up more time, but somebody asks you for that. Or someone asks you for a favor. Man, when I was in my, early, my 20s, I had a truck, and I was like the only person in my friend group that had a truck. I got asked to move stuff every weekend. I'd be like, go buy your own truck. But you know, you get, you get, you get sick of that, right? And it's so hard to just be overflowing with generosity. It can be hard to be generous to give above and beyond what's deserved or what's expected with no expectation of being repaid. So when you see generosity, I think it's natural for us to ask, and we should ask, where does that come from? Where, how does that come out? And to get at this, I want to ask a question for us, for us all to consider. Just kind of reverse it here, reverse engineering. What makes generosity difficult in your own life? What can make it hard to be generous? And like I mentioned, this, this has been just hitting me hard this week because um, I think about when Lindsay and I were first married, and even before we were married, but when we had, we had nothing but maybe a little debt, that was, that was our net worth, it, we, it was so easy to be generous. And I feel like we were kind of generous people. I mean, we didn't think about it, but looking back, I'm like going, what happened? We used to be generous people. Uh, you know, things that we gave or things that we did and didn't think twice about it. And now I'm going, I don't think we would do that now. And I'm, and I'm wondering, why not? What's, what's happened? Why, why are we being, why is it so hard for us to be generous sometimes? Um, 
I remember hearing a sermon years ago, somebody was speaking about this, the preacher was talking about this, and he talked about a similar thing and how when you have nothing, it's kind of easy to be like, oh, I can give anything, because you don't have anything really to give anyway. And then as life goes on, and if you kind of, you know, seem to accumulate a few things, or if, you know, you get in a more stable place in life, or maybe just a more secure place with material possessions, now you have stuff, it's a lot harder to give of that stuff. Um, I think that's just true, I think, probably for all of us. I know that this is, God has been convicting me of this this week. So what can make it hard? Let's think of a few things. Number one, let me, let me just throw out some ideas. I think it, that it's easy to struggle with being generous because of fear. We can fear not having enough. Right? If I give this, then I may not have enough. Um, I, I, I might fear struggle or hardship. If I don't have this, this thing then what if something hard happens and now I can't deal with it because I gave away what I had? You know, we have this fear. I think another thing is pride. I think that's a big one, especially, like I said, here in Johnson County, Kansas, in a, in a community like this one, we go, I earned this. I deserve this. I know money is not easy to come by. It doesn't grow on trees. And it's, I'm not just going to give it away to somebody who will waste it. I'm not going to give it to that guy on the street who's just going to use it for booze and alcohol or booze and drugs. I'm not going to give it to that ministry or that nonprofit that just won't use it as, or won't use it as efficiently as I will. So I just, you know, forget that. I think we can all we can struggle with that with this kind of pride. I think a big one also um, is the is a sense of false security that can come from having stuff, from possessions, right? The, the things we have, we can feel like they make us safe. I'm secure now, I'm safe now because I have this stuff. And there's something, you know, profound that happens with this. The possessions, I'm going to speak primarily about financial or hard resources, material things, valuable things, because that's what Paul is, is, is referencing in this passage. Possessions that we have that we think support us, protect us, help us, serve us, actually they begin to, it, that turns on us, and those possessions actually begin to imprison us. They begin to hold us down. They begin to control us. And when we think that they're serving us, in effect, really, we are serving them. And how does that happen? Well, because ultimately, our possessions can become for us our, our location of our hope, the source of our identity, the source of our security, the source of our salvation. They can become godlike. You know, the Bible talks about that a lot. There, the Bible talks about money a lot, um, a lot. And one of the things that, that it, it consistently says is that, hey, money is not a bad thing. Money is a neutral thing, and often it's a very good thing. But we have to watch out because money, wealth, can become an ultimate thing if we're not careful. And when it becomes an ultimate thing, that's when we look to it for our grounding in life, our security, our hope, our meaning, our, like I said, our salvation. Money is where we turn, or possessions is where we turn for everything. When, when, when we're supposed to be turning not to a created thing like money, but the creator of that created thing, who is God. I mean, a, an image that, Linz doesn't like this one, but I like it, and I'm going to share it with you. Um, but it reminds me, and you guys might not, you might be sick of, like I mentioned a few weeks ago, the Lord of the Rings. But man, it's just, there's a reason why preachers go to it. It's just, it's, it's so clear. And you maybe don't know, have never seen this, but there's a character in that movie, in the books, called Gollum. Remember Gollum, the little gross guy? And he's, he's this formerly human-looking man, like a guy who looks like a human being, who finds this ring of power, and the ring of power like dominates the whole story, it gives Gollum like this sense of security and hope, and it's like he's beautiful, and he loves it, and he treasures it, and he calls it his precious, and he holds to it so tightly, and he, and he finds everything in life that he wants in this ring, and what happens is over time, because he just fixates on this thing, and it becomes his entire life, it warps him, you know? He, be, he develops into this gross, green, twisted creature I don't know why he's green, but he's green, at least in the movie. And um, it, it ruins his life. It enslaves him. He can't function. He can't live without the ring. He can't, like, actually have happiness and peace and security in life if he doesn't have the ring. And our possessions can become like that. 
And, they, and it becomes this thing where now we are working ourselves to the bone. We're working ourselves to bad health to make our accounts grow. We're sacrificing relationships, friendships, marriages, relationships with children sometimes so that we can get that promotion, so that we can get that new, bigger house, so that we can get whatever. And those, it, we become, you know, does that make sense? We start working for those things. We start serving those things instead of those things providing for us what we think is a truly, will be a truly fulfilling life. Because they can't. They can't provide those things. They're not God. When a good thing, a house, money, security, I mean, those are good things. They're not bad. But when they become the ultimate thing for us, that's when the problem happens and they become, they take the place of God in our life. So go back to the Philippians. The Philippians again. Think about how they gave. Okay? I know that's a hard one. I won't beat you up. This is beating me up all week, so I'm just bringing you into my own personal sorrow. Okay, But think about the Philippians again. All right? When they gave to the Apostle Paul, I think this is so instructive for us. They did not, I don't want to get ahead of myself, they did not give out of a place of security and ease. They gave out of a place of trial and uncertainty. Remember, they were, they were facing, because of their faith in Jesus, and, and they, were, they were proclaiming Jesus is Lord, all of us should follow him and obey him in a place where everyone else was saying, no, Caesar is Lord. Christians, be quiet. And because of their faith in Jesus, they were facing a, a opposition from the surrounding community. And that opposition led to real-life consequences. They were losing jobs in, a, in an honor-shame culture like they lived in. That meant your family could lose jobs. You were, you were, it was putting them in serious daily danger. You know? that, and so when they gave, they gave out of that, knowing that you know, we might lose everything because of Jesus, but we're still going to give to Paul. This is, this is the kind of giving they're giving. And Paul praises them for this. Let me make sure I'm clear on this. Paul praises them for the kind of giving that they give to him. And this would drive Dave Ramsey nuts. And I like Dave Ramsey. But they didn't like, give out of their plan. They didn't give out of their abundance. or off the, They gave sacrificially, which we're going to see. They gave in a way that cost them. They gave out beyond their overflow and over their surplus. And Paul uses the, that word, and I want to look at it pretty, for a little bit, to help us understand their kind of giving. In verse 18, second half of verse 18, he says, I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus, the man who brought the gift to Paul, I am, I'm amply supplied from the gifts that you sent. Here's the thing. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice Pleasing to God. Now that word, sacrifice, I think can, has a two-sided meaning for us when we think about this point of generosity and the, the Philippians giving in this passage. First of all, sacrifice tells us that it was costly to them. It was costly. This didn't come from the abundant leftovers of what they had, but from their needs for daily living. This went beyond their budget. This went beyond what they could really even afford in their daily life. But because of their, well, well I'm going to hit myself. This, it, was, it was costly to them. But that word sacrifice, it also tells us something else as well that I, I really want us to see because it's so awesome. When Paul uses this language that he uses, fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God, he's using language that is, that is straight out of the Old Testament. This is Jewish Old Testament language. Um, and it, it, it is drawing us into the temple of the, uh, the, the, the worship of the Israelite people at the temple. When the Israelite people would come to the great temple in Jerusalem, they would, they would bring with them sacrifices. They would bring animals. They would bring like their crops, like wheat. They would bring bread. And they would take those things to the temple where God's presence dwelt. And they would lay them down. They would offer them to God. They brought a sacrifice to him. And what, that, what they were doing in that was they were worshiping. Their gift was a way of worshiping God, acknowledging that he was the one who had provided all this for him, for them. He was the Lord of heaven and earth. He was their God. He was their strength. He was their helper. He was the one who had redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. All of these things, their, their offering, that sacrifice, was a means of worship, 
of recognizing God and declaring God's greatness and, and obeying God. And so when Paul says that this Philippians gift to him is a fragrant offering to the Lord, this sacrifice that's pleasing to him, he's in effect saying that this was, that by giving to Paul, they were giving to God. They were worshiping. They were giving a sacrifice to him. And it's so, we need to see that. They weren't just giving to Paul because they were buds. Like, oh, I know Paul, he's my friend, I want to help him out financially. They were giving to Paul because they understood that by giving to, to him, they were helping the cause of the gospel. They were helping proclaim the name of Jesus all over the known world because Paul was God's commissioned apostle to the, to the Gentiles. The Philippians knew that. They knew that, he had, that Jesus had made himself known to them through Paul, and they want to support him. They want to continue to help the gospel go forward because they've been changed by Jesus. They now find their hope and security and life and salvation in him, and they want to use what God has given them to now help that go forward, help the gospel go forward. So in effect, they are worshiping God by giving to Paul. Because by giving to Paul, they're actually giving to God. It's incredible. And what I want you to see, well, let me say this. I didn't plan on this, but I think I can mention this. In, in, in uh, beginning in March, um, the, the first Sunday of every month, beginning in March, we're going to start doing something that we have not been able yet to do as a church plan or just felt like we didn't have the, the, res the people resources to do. But we're going to start taking a monthly offering which is something that you, know, you would probably experience in most churches if you've ever been in churches. We have not really done that. We used to have a little box off to the side for like uh, gifts or financial gifts or offerings people wanted to make. But we're going to start incorporating that into our worship. This opportunity for all of us, adults, kids, anybody, to give a, a financial gift or offering to the, not just to, not to Fountain City. It will go to Fountain City, but it's an act of worship. It's, it's proclaiming that God is God and we follow him and, and we trust him by giving money. I know a lot of us do that online, so it's not like we don't give. But uh, we're going to start you know, incorporating that in our monthly worship because that is part of worship. Giving of the things that God has given us to the work of the gospel. And the work of the gospel takes place in a church like this. So, all that said, what I want us to focus on, though, is that the Philippians were able to give this gift and they were generous to Paul because through their faith in Jesus, they had been freed from the power of their stuff. They had found freedom in Jesus. Their stuff wasn't their hope anymore. Their stuff wasn't their source of security anymore. Jesus was. Jesus had freed them from that. And... and for our point this morning, that was the secret to their generosity. And so, you, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to formulate a, an argument that is difficult to make just on its own, but this passage is kind of convoluted, so I'm trying to get at it from, you know, hopefully it's making sense to you. Here's how the flow of it works. Generosity comes from freedom from our stuff. True freedom comes from ident finding our identity and hope and security in Christ. And this freedom, this gets us to our third point, this freedom is yours through the gospel because, point three, it tells us that in Jesus Christ, we've been given everything. In Jesus Christ, you have been given everything. So look again at verse 19. We're going to wrap up with this, with this verse. Paul says this to the, to the Philippians. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This week, earlier this week, I was, I was um, doing some Bible reading, and Henry came up and sat with me, and, and we read through Psalm 24. I don't know if you know Psalm 24, but it starts this way. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. What does that mean? It's really cool. What it means is that every single thing you see, this whole room, when you go home, every tree, every house, every rock, every person, every bird, everything you see, even yourself in the mirror, belongs to God. It is the Lord's. Why? Because he made it. He is the maker of heaven and earth. 
He is the origin. He's the source of all things, and all things belong to him. They all come from him, and they all belong to him. And out of his generosity, he shares all of that with us. He gives it to us. He wants us to enjoy what he's made. He gives it as a gift. And here, Paul is telling us something about the gospel that really will explode our comprehension and kind of go far beyond what what we're going to be able to handle today. But he is saying that in Christ, in and through Christ, God has given us us access and ownership, really, to everything. Everything. This week I, I I was praying through this passage. I was trying to just discern, like, what what to say and, and how to say it. and I'm trusting that God will, will make this make sense to you where you need to hear it. Um, but I had this like image pop into my head as I was praying. I was like, okay, this is interesting. And it was like this humongous like cavern. This, a, 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 like a, a huge, like, I mean, it, you ever see National Treasure? I know I mention movies a lot because they're so visual, but there's a movie National Treasure. And at the end, these treasure hunters find this massive underground cavernous room that's full of like the biggest treasure you could ever imagine. And it's like, it fills the room. I mean, it's the treasure of all treasures. So I'm looking at this room and I see this room full of all these treasures beyond what you could ever like use, right? It's just a silly, infinite kind of number of, of treasures. And I'm looking at that and then the like scene changes in my mind because I'm like thinking all this through. And I begin looking at the cross, the cross of Christ with, with Jesus on the cross. And I think I was, I was thinking about that because it's, it's through the cross, it's on the cross, that the riches of all that belongs to God, everything he has made, is given to you. On the cross, when Jesus, the Son of God, dies, the heaven and earth join in one place, and there on the cross, the door is opened for you and me, the door that our, closed, or our sin closed. The door that, you, that, that, that closed because you and I turned away from the creator to created things. We distrusted God. We disobeyed him. Sin came in, separated us from God. Closed the door to relationship and fellowship with him. Closed the door to the goodness of life and the fullness of God intended it. Because of Jesus on the cross, that door has been opened. Through Jesus and his sacrificial death for you and for me, we have been brought back into fellowship with God, relationship with God, good standing with God. We are now his children. We have now been made heirs. Paul says in another letter to a different church, he says we are now co-heirs with Christ. You know what that means? Everything that belongs to Christ, we are heirs of the same kind. That is is so, that's scandalous to our minds. We go, that can't be right. That's what the Bible tells us. Everything that belongs to Jesus Christ will be given to us. A new heavens, a new earth, a new kingdom, a a redeemed world, that's going to be given to us where we will reign with Christ. We will steward it. We will work it. We will reign over it with him. We have to wait for that, but that's all been given to you and given to me. And right now, as part of God's family, as his children, God's promise is that he will provide every single thing you and I need. Everything is his, and he can give you any single, every single thing you need and beyond that. He can go far and beyond what you could ever imagine, far and beyond what you could ever even think about, because he has it all, and he will give it to you all. He will pr- and Paul makes this promise to the church of Philippi. He's making a very strong promise. He's saying, you gave to me as an act of worship to God. And I'm telling you, my God, and he's not trying to say there's like some different God. He's just saying, listen, I'm representing God for you right now. My God will meet all of your needs, all of your needs, according to his riches in Christ. In Christ, you have access to everything. God will give you everything you need. It may not be wealth. It may not be extravagance, but what you need, he will give you. Every time you are generous, anytime you give, anytime you obey God and give to him and his kingdom and the gospel work, God will meet every single one of your needs. He will never let you go the way, you know, whatever it is. Even if it costs you your own life, you still will get what you need. Because think about this again with, your, with resources. All of us are going to meet the end of our lives someday. All of us will, fi- will die. That is true. That is reality. And at the end of our lives, nothing we own right now will be able to help us. 
Nothing can help you. Your house, your retirement accounts, your great accolades and trophies on the wall. When you're about to face God, when you're, gonna, when you're about to die, none of those things can give you what you need. But Jesus can. He will meet every single one of your needs. This is amazing. This is the gospel. The gospel frees us to be generous people because in Christ we've been given everything. Let me tell you a couple of things. Let me close with a few stories. We're almost out of here. I want to share how I've, I've seen this uh, truth and generosity at work in, in the life of our church. Because this isn't like, I don't think this needs to be a, a beat you over the head kind of message. Or a, this is not a guilt trip message. This is a, I want you to hear this as an encouraging and empowering and joyful, hopeful message. Because the, God, Lisa, I've seen God's presence and power at work in this church because of how generous this church is. Uh, and, how gen- well, and how we've seen generosity. Remember a couple, um, two years ago, some of you, many of you know this, our church, almost exactly, it was two years ago in December, uh, you remember we had all of our materials, all the stuff we would use on a Sunday morning, we had it stored in a trailer, and that trailer got stolen. And so we lost all of our stuff. And it was a lot. We had like eighteen dollars or $19,000 worth of stuff in there that had come from a big gift someone had given us. And because of some complications, insurance didn't cover that, blah, blah, blah. Well, what happened? God's people, churches that we're connected with because of our denomination, what did they do? They gave abundantly to us as a church, and they gave financially to us more than we had lost. And this wasn't like, oh, we're just like a super mega rich church, and we can just give you a check anytime. It was like, they gave out of a costliness to them. They gave out of a budget line that didn't cover that for us. But they gave generously to us, and it blessed us incredibly. This year, we, um, you guys don't see this, and and like I said, we don't have an offering during our worship, so we don't see each other give. But we had an incredibly generous end-of-the-year giving from within our church. People gave, our bookkeeper tells me all these things. Um, But we had this massive end of the year gift from our congregation that was just like far and above beyond what we had usually seen. That's generosity. That's God putting on our hearts, hey, I want you to give to my, to my work, to the kingdom work that's happening in this church. That's amazing. One more thing. Many of you know this because you're part of it. Um, Annika Bergen, who's not with us this morning because she's in California or on her way to California, because she's working with a, a ministry called Exodus Cry that helps women who are being trafficked, and, and the Super Bowl is a primary place for that. So she's out there doing some work with them, Exodus Cry. Uh, I, I had nothing to do with this. That's why I can share. It's like, I, this is so cool, because I had nothing to do with it. But our, Annika's part of the home group that meets at my house, and our home group came around Annika, said, how could we help you? And some financial you know, giving would help, could help her where, with what she's doing. And so our home group generously gave to Annika, I forget the amount, it's not important, but several hundred dollars throw hundreds of dollars to Annika with some other gifts as well to help support her and just bless her in this work that she's doing in in California. That's awesome. That is the generosity that comes from God at work in our lives. That's generosity that comes from the gospel. This This is what I'm talking about. The gospel frees us to be generous people because in Christ we have everything. That's, that's so good. So I, want, I just want us to think about that this week and just, and just think, can you imagine? Man, what could God do in and through us as, as we continue to be generous people? If we, if we, if we believe it. it, all comes back to that belief part. If we would believe, believe the gospel day in and day out and with faith follow him and trust him and believe that Jesus will meet all of my needs, that his way is the best, that my stuff is not, but his way is. And man, I will be part of that like generous lifestyle. It's incredible. It's incredible. And I love how Paul uh, ends this. I'm going to end it this way with him. The only right response to any of these stories, the only right response to any time we see generosity in others, we receive it. By God's grace, we give it. It's this. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. All of this work, the kingdom work, generosity, blessing others, it's all about uh, giving glory and honor to God from whom all of these gifts have come. It's the doxology that we often will sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Right? So with that, let me pray, and we'll move on. So please pray with me.
God, we thank you for your abundant grace and generosity to us. We thank you that in your son Jesus, you have given us everything. We thank you for your forgiveness of our sin. We thank you for your grace to us to bring us into your family. We thank you for making us co-heirs with Christ. Jesus, we thank you that you have made all this possible by the generosity of giving your own life, dying for us on the cross, giving us everything far and above what we ever deserved. We didn't deserve any of that, and yet you gave it. We give you thanks, Lord, and ask, please be glorified in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, we now turn to our our time of communion every week. And in communion, I think we see the purest, most powerful example of generosity. Right? Perhaps, and perhaps no verse in the scriptures communicates this to us more clearly than, than John 3.16, the verse that we all know. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that he would, whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I want us to hear this this morning. God loves us. He loves you. We were de- you and I, the gospel tells us, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, our transgressions. We were enemies of God, as we've confessed already this morning. But God chose to give to us. He chose to give to us his only son so that we could have forgiveness and life. He gave far beyond, like I've said already, what, what, what we deserve. We didn't deserve any of what he gave. We deserve death, but what does God give us? He gives us life. And he gives it to us through the death of his own son. He gives us grace. So as we receive this morning, we are going to see in the, and I'm going to introduce communion a little bit longer this morning as well. We see in the bread and in the juice, the body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for us. His life given as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that we might have new life with God and have it to the full. That's what this meal points us to and fills us with every every week. The promise that in Christ all that you and I need has been given to us. All that we need for salvation. All that we need for his presence and his power at work in us every day has been given to us. And we receive that even this morning. So as you come this morning, let me say this before I I give us instructions. I want you to take a moment because it's going to take a while to come up. We're going to come to the front this morning. I want you to take that time and just encourage you to reflect on all that God has done for you. Reflect on those things and come up with a, 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 a heart of thanksgiving and of celebration. Because Jesus has, he is the victor. He has overcome all of our sin. He has overcome all death. He has overcome the enemy. He has given us life everlasting. That is yours in Christ. So come up and receive that way this morning. Now, we do have um, a new way we're going to do this today. I don't know if you can see this. I'll hold it up. <clears throat> this morning we have one bread and a cup with, with juice instead of wine. But we have this this morning. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the bread, and Doug Karst is going to hold the cup. And as you come forward... If you're comfortable, I'm going to rip off a piece of bread for you and hand it to you. And then you can take that and dip it in the cup that Doug is holding and receive that way. If you're a little uh, not comfortable with that yet because of COVID, we also have some communion packets, those little cups that you can just open and uh, has the wafer and the little red liquid in there that you can receive um, as well. So you can choose. With that said, this is going to be hard for me to do this. Um, but I'm gonna, I want to read for, to you what Paul told the church in Corinth about what we are about to receive. And so this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying... This bread is my body, 
which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So with that, why don't we all stand? And one more, one more instruction before you come forward. Here's how I'm going to have us come forward. We're going to come this side. So everybody just kind of find your way over to this side of the room. And we're going to do a loop this way. All right, so you're going to come to the front, either receive the bread or the packet. And once you've received, come on through that to this side of the room and go back to your seat uh, by the windows. Okay? So coming down this way around the front and back to your seats that way. Children, parents, please bring your kids up with you. Um, we're not going to give them the, the meal this morning, but we can pray for them and, and give them a quick blessing as they come with you. Okay? So, on page 13, in the bolded text, let us, as one church, proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Want to come on up?
would you stand as we close in song? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand his oath his covenant his blood supports me in the whelming flood all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand amen well church as you go now from here go knowing that in christ he who is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine goes with you and in Christ, may you be filled with faith and courage to walk in freedom, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you may abound in every good work. To the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bye.